Human Development, Education and Role Livelihoods. In this session, we have two papers. One by Karthi Murli Dhan. It will be talk on aggregate effects of school choice, evidence from a two-stage experiment. Karthi Murli Dhan uh, is, uh, I think, well-known person in this uh, group, uh, but he is an assistant professor of economics at the University of uh, California, San Diego. Uh, his primary uh, research interests include development, public and labor economics. He holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Uh, Vijendra Rao will be talking on, uh, from World Bank, will be talking on designing a social observatory for National World Libraries Mission. Uh, Vijendra Rao is a lead economist uh, in the development research group of the World Bank. He integrates his training in economics with theories and methods from anthropology, sociology, political science to uh, study social, cultural and political context of extreme poverty in developing countries. He holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. So first, I would request Karthi to talk for about 25 minutes, followed by five minutes of question and answer session, and then uh, then that will be followed by talk uh, by Jindra. So first, I think I'm sorry to Hopefully, I think, yeah, even for people who've heard me multiple times in the past week, I mean, this is, uh, hopefully this is new. Uh, so this is joint work with Michael and Venki, and it's been, it's work that's been underway for four years, so it's just being brought out right now, so I'm looking forward to comments. Uh, so basically, the background to this, uh, those of you who know my work in education and some of the other facts in education in India, uh, I don't need to belabor these major facts, which is primary school enrollment is very high, but learning levels are really low. Uh, severe accountability problems in the public education system. So there's another paper which I initially proposed presenting, which is we've just finished an all India panel study of the same schools that we covered back in 2003. And the headline number is that the teacher absence rates have stayed at the same at 25% over the seven years, even though you've increased spending on SSA. And so there's a lot of work we do there with school level fixed effects and, sorry, and school level panel data. But bottom line is service delivery continues to be a major problem. And so the one major phenomenon that's been happening in Indian education in the past 10 years is an explosion in the number of budget private schools catering to the poor. And so if you look at the numbers, uh, so this is the paper by Sonali Desai and many and others uh, using the Human Development Survey data in 2005, and they estimate that over 20% of the rural children and 50% of the urban children in <laughs> 6 to 14 attend private fee charging schools. To put that number in perspective about how ridiculously high that number is relative to most public schooling systems in the world, is this is higher than Chile, right? And Chile has a fully voucher-based system, so where you can pay public funding and go to any private school. So India has more kids in private school than Chile, which has a fully voucher-based system. So it just gives you a sense of how big the magnitude of private schooling is in India. And <clears throat> Yeah, we've done some work and uh, other work looking at the drivers of the demand, and the two main drivers of demand for private schools appear to be, on one hand, a demand for English, which seems to be not catered to as much in the public schooling system, and the sense of public school failure. So uh, this is a slide I took out, but if you look at the predictors of the village having a private school in our all India sample, in fact, it's negatively correlated with district per capita income, but positively correlated to public school teacher apps. Now, of course, that's all correlational, but suggested that public school failure is a non not in all public schools. So, in fact, uh, yeah. So there are many states where, and we can talk later about about the network aspects of language. But you know, this, the one-line summary of language policy in India is most politicians want their own kids in English medium school, but would like the state system to run in the local language, right? Like, I mean, and it's, it's in fact, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll save this talk for discussion because there's a very nice book by a friend of mine who's now a professor at Yale Law School on network power. It's talking about how, what globalization is in many ways, is convergence in certain standards, and so while nobody forces you to learn English, it is done of volition, but there's still a certain element of coercion because you were kind of shut out of networks if you're not in that mainstream. So I mean, these are complicated issues, right? So bottom line is just the, the big demand for private schools is not really driven by demand for English. So here are just some summary stats from our sample, is that the private school kids on average tend to do significantly better than the government school kids, about 0.65 standard deviations in math and language. But as you might expect, uh, these parents are also more affluent, and yeah, they're more affluent, more likely to be educated, and government school kids have more, uh, schools have more kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, as you might imagine, the private schools struggle with these. Um, so this is back in 2007, 8, when we started the project, so those numbers are higher now. But basically, government schools are free, and private schools charge, that's about 1,500 rupees a year, so it's not surprising that it's only better off parents who go there. 
But the flip side is if you look at this from a public funding perspective and compare the fees with the per child spending in the public sector, then it would look like I mean, the private schools are in fact a steal, right? Because the average per capita spending per child in the public schooling system is on average at least three times if not higher than the total per child cost in the typical private school. Okay? So the combination of these facts essentially you know, so the motivation, of course, is that existing studies find significantly higher test scores in private schools, but you know, both of these papers that we did with cross-sectional data and this other paper are confounded by with their little selection issues. And CUNY and the cross-sectional data suggest a strong case for considering voucher-based education reforms that fund students and not schools. And so the basic idea <coughs> of course, is increasing choice and competition. Um, there's ethical as well as efficiency reasons to consider this. And in particular, the policy dialogue in education in India is being very concerned about social stratification in education, right? I mean, it's completely correlated with income. And one response to this has been the Right to Education Act that has a provision that says the 25% of seats in private schools should be reserved for children of economically backward segments. But as is pretty common in India, like this policy change was made without the foggiest idea of what the impact of something like this would be. And so we just have no evidence whatsoever on what would be the impact of something Right? So what we're doing in this paper is basically presenting results from the first large-scale school choice experiment in India. And the experiment is designed to mimic some of the key provisions of the RTE Act with respect to reservations in private schools. Um, the experiment was conducted across 180 villages in the state of AP. And I think intellectually what's very interesting about this is that now obviously we're pushing the envelope in terms of the evidence in India, but even relative to the global literature, the main contribution we're making is using the fact that communities are pretty close to being closed economies for school choice and pri for, for primary school, that we are able to run a market level experiment. Right? So the idea is that this is a two-stage experiment, and I'll show you the design in just a second, okay, to give you a sense of what's going on. So let's just look at this picture. Okay, so if you look at this picture, this is the typical experimental design of school choice studies. So these are the best studies in the world, right? So uh, uh, Cullen, Jacob, Levy, mm -hmm. Metrica, Angrist, Kramer, AR. So all of these kind of really well-known, uh, considered best of the breed school choice studies basically use a design that's essentially something that has a, a scholarship or voucher program that kids in public schools can choose to apply for, okay? But not everybody will apply. So you have kids in the public schools who do not apply. This is a group of kids who apply for the scholarship. And then you have a lottery, right? So these are the winners of the lottery, these are the losers of the lottery, right? So group three versus group two is the state of the art in terms of in analyzing the impact of school vouchers of choice. What you don't know, so there's three problems, right? And then this is a group of kids who starts out in the private school to begin with, okay? So there's three problems in the status quo. One, and one big concern for voucher skeptics is that are these kids being hurt because you've lost some of your most motivated peers, right? So the motivated peers are the ones who take the vouchers and go to the private school. So are these kids hurt? <coughs> then you might worry, are these kids hurt because they have an influx of below average kids, like I mean, who are coming in and, and, and sitting in the classroom. So the fact that these kids are 0.6 standard deviations behind is that does that have negative spillovers and the kids are already in the private school. But even more fundamentally is this control group is not, in fact, a pure control group, right? Because the control group is contaminated by the fact that some of these kids have, in fact, left. It's contaminated by competitive responses on the part of the schools, right? I mean, schools might now decide to do something more to hang on to the kids who have a choice of leaving. And the resources typically don't follow these kids one for one because teachers are lumpy. And so typically, you might probably have an increase in a uh, reduction in class size in this group. So there's, a, there's many, many reasons for thinking that state of the art is not, in fact, as good as we'd like it in terms of how we think about the control as well as the spillovers. Now, one thing, the initial title of this paper was the general equilibrium effect, and we've kind of toned that down because general equilibrium involves freedom of entry and exit of schools in the long run. Like, I mean, and that's not something we're really going to be able to get at, right? What we're going to get at is really aggregate in a cross section, looking at what happens to each of these groups. And so the key fact of the design here is, and this is where the two-stage experiment comes in, is that we first collect baseline test score data on every kid in every school in 180 villages, right? That can mean for kindergarten and grade one. So there's two cohorts that we're following. And once we do that, we then go and offer the parents a chance to apply for a scholarship, right? So scholarship and voucher, we use the terms interchangeably, um, just because in India, voucher is kind of politically too loaded, like it means so scholarship is something people understand, but there's nothing in this that's conditional in performance, the way the word scholarship would be. So it's basically the same. Okay? So, and then what you have is you get the applications from the parents, so parents have a chance to apply for the scholarship, but then normally they would apply, and when they apply, you're told very clearly that you're not guaranteed to get this, right? You're applying, and then there's a chance that you might or might not get it. So 
But the key difference here is that you might not get it at two levels. So normally you would apply and you would not get it if you have this lottery and you might lose the lottery and then, or you might win. Except now what happens is there's first in a village level lottery, right? I mean, where about half the villages are randomized into being in the scholarship program and the other half are controlled villages. And then conditional on being a scholarship village, you have a second lottery whereby some of these kids then get the, then get the scholarship. So now what this does is it creates a complete counterfactual economy of what this economy would look like without school choice, right? Because notice that these kids apply and these kids apply, right? Like, I mean, and these are the kids who get, who get the scholarship. But now I'm going to compare these guys not with these kids, but these kids with these kids, right? And then when it comes to the spillovers, you can look at what happens to the kids who start out in the private school here and compare them to the kids who started out in the private school here to begin with, but who in fact don't have this influx of, of scholarship kids, right? I mean, and then you can do exactly the same thing here, which is what happens to kids who don't apply. These are both kids who don't apply, but nothing changes in their lives. But over here, something has changed because the kids have moved on, right? Is that design clear? How do we ensure that they're not Oh, because the villages are, it, it, so even if there is potential spillovers, like the first stage with distance is so high, like I mean that it's not going to matter, but in any case these villages are pretty wide apart, right? Like, I mean, so that's not, that's not, that's not going to matter, okay? So, so that's the basic design, and the key features of the scholarship program at the household level are, this is completely voluntary, so you can always go back to the public school, there's no conditions whatsoever, except, you know, and we don't even specify this, I mean, it's kind of implicit, the scholarship covered all school fees, books, and uniforms, but does not cover transport and midday meals. And the household did not see any cash or physical vouchers. The payments are made directly to schools. Okay? On the school side, this is again completely voluntary. So the project is implemented by the Azim Prairie Foundation. And so the fees are set at the 90th percentile of the distribution of private school fees, because there is a distribution of private school fees. And the idea was to set this high enough to be above marginal cost for every school, so that it wouldn't, it, there's no pressure here. Um, and in some sense, this is a pre-specified five-year contract, right, with a rate of fee increase. So all of this is kind of specified into the school contract up front. And then the schools have a choice, right? You don't have to participate. So A, do you want to participate? And B, if you participate, how many places are you willing to offer, right? So, Sorry, I'm just being stupid, but these are all private schools. These are all so private all schools. schools are private these are all private schools. Right? Like, I mean, so this school level agreement is only with private schools, correct? Okay? Um, and so the schools are not allowed to cherry pick students, right? So suppose the school says, I'm willing to participate in this program and I offer 10 spots. And it happens that there's 15 kids who want to come to that school, then the schools can do one of two things. Either you accept all 15 or you have a lottery, right? I mean, for which 10 out of the 15 go? So in many ways, this is a design that looks a lot like what the draft RTE looked like in 2005, right? Because there was this draft RTE bill and we started this project in 2007. So the idea was to mimic the key provisions in that draft RTE bill, which talked about excess spots being allocated by the lottery, about the 25% being allocated by the lottery, and of course this is also good for us from a scientific design perspective, but the idea was to design something exactly wrapping <laughs> into what the policy was supposed to be. Okay. So the timeline, and I'll just go through this. That, sorry, the scholarship sorry. is for five years? Yes. So that doesn't correspond to any existing program? Well, so I think what the government's idea was that this lottery for getting into the schools would be done in grade one, right? Like, I mean, and then the schools are not allowed to kick you out on the basis of academic performance, right? But any public program is not, no one has put in place a five-year program of scholarships, right? And that, that's going to end. Right, okay, so that's a good question in terms of what do they think about the continuation of this? And the logic of five years is that's the length of primary school, right? So primary school is five years. So the idea is that the major school transition then happens beyond from five to six, so it's a miracle that we got five-year funding, like yeah, you know, no, even not. being able to do this. And so I think you know, if we would send this with one or two years, then I'd be a lot more worried because you know it's like what happens to me? Am I left out to hang and dry after two years of this? But you're basically guaranteeing the completion of primary school, right? I mean, which seems like as 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 good as we could. So what's the mechanism for the kids with the voucher uh -huh. select which school they go to, and if so, what is the matching procedure? So that's a good question. I mean, so basically what happens is, uh, yeah, so let me just walk through this timeline and then I'll just come back, okay? So timeline, like I said, so the project was implemented by the Primity Foundation with support from WDP, the World Bank, and really we should acknowledge the, acknowledge the Nevada Institute, who are the ones who funded this for five years, even the World Bank doesn't have fiscal visibility to allow us to do something like that. So this came from a private foundation. Um, 
And then we start in, in Jan, Feb 2008, by identifying these 200 villages across five districts with at least one private school. And the average village in our sample has about three private schools. So these are larger villages, right? So there is some competition. And conducting a census of all schools in the identified villages. Then there's this baseline assessment. Then there's this baseline household socioeconomic survey where you have all baseline covariates. And then you ask the parents, like, would you be interested in applying for scholarship under the following terms and conditions? Um, and then a parallel proposal goes to the schools to see, like, I mean, are the schools willing to participate? And the 200 became 180 because there were a bunch of schools that refused to participate, or there were some places that were just too small. Uh, so, uh, because the other consideration was to get these GE effects, like, I mean, you wanted this place to be <coughs> at least of a reasonable size, a very small village, it didn't make sense. And then there's sample villages randomly allocated to treatment and control, and then within the treatment, a proportion of applicants are offered a scholarship. So then we get to your question. So basically, there's about 6,433 applications for the scholarship we have across treatment and control villages, out of whom 1,980 were offered scholarship, and out of which 1,210 were accepted. So then households that were accepted were advised to choose a school by the end of June. So they had a week or two. And so typically what would happen is foundation <coughs> staff would facilitate communications with the schools to say that these are scholarship kids, we will be paying, you know, we will be paying the fees. And but it was up to the parents to choose which school they wanted to go. So the parents did, in fact, you know, and then we have a lot of process data of how they chose schools and how many schools they visited and all of that stuff. But that's, you know, that's more part of a set of descriptive summary statistics. But mostly they visit, they visit, uh, I think on average, they, the average school village has about three schools. I think they report visiting about two schools. But mostly they pick the nearest private school, right? So distance ends up being a big factor in, in, in what they choose. You didn't, you didn't think of some report card intervention? So what we had initially thought about was that, because remember, we don't even have detailed outcome data on these schools. Right? So we had considered at some point over these five years adding and embellishing that information. But right now, like, I mean, that was not. See, if, if you were in an urban area, like, I mean, we might have thought of that. In the villages, we just didn't have that to also do that. Right? So, so, did you target some children who were the starting school? So what age of the child? Yeah, so the two cohorts are basically moving from Anandwari to grade one and from grade one to grade two. So we wanted to start young because we did some pilots earlier, and by the time they were older, the gaps are already so large that the private school would only accept them at a much lower rate. Um, so those are the two cohorts. Now the households chose, but then the, obviously the, there would be class size limits and school limits. So what happened if a particular school was oversubscribed? Right. So so that's what was here, right? So the schools were asked if they wanted to participate in the program, and if so, how many seats they would offer the scholarships to. Right? And so what we see on average is that the supply elasticity of teachers, for example, for private schools is relatively very really elastic. Right? So they don't seem to have a problem kind of just hiring an extra teacher. But in many cases, a school might be receiving five kids or six kids. Because if you've got 25 kids in your class or 30 kids, you're getting about 15 to 20 percent increase in, in, uh, in the kids who come in. So on average, we've looked at this across all the private schools. There does not seem to be a difference in the pupil-teacher ratio. But that is something we could go grand. <coughs> <laughs> looking at heterogeneity to see what happened to this. Because if there are a number of schools where there is additional hiring going on, then that's a different story. Well, it's not, right? I mean, it is part of whatever. See, in some sense, we're taking a pretty agnostic view on mechanisms. Like, I mean, and saying this looks like what the RTE would do, right? Like, I mean, and let's run, let's mimic this at a system level, and then let the schools do whatever they would do, subject to these basic conditions of no cherry picking of kids and no kind of kicking out kids, like, I mean, because they're not doing. Right? I mean, so those were the two main regulatory conditions that we enforced, but we're not micromanaging what the schools do in any way. Right? So, so Karthi, the schools are there already, right? Yes. And then the, the <coughs> anybody, any kid of about 10 to primary school can qualify for the yeah, so the, the only, a, a rich parent no, right. So the only condition for basically, so for grade one, it's not a problem because we use being enrolled in the government school as a sufficient statistic of being economically backward because we would have already started out in the private school. And the reason this works for the pre-K is because most private schools, in fact, have two years of kindergarten. They have a LKG and UKG where the kids yeah. start. And so for that cohort, the eligibility is coming from being in the government other bodies, like I mean, and then we have it. So I should go, I've probably got 10 minutes left. So let me, let me so this is fine. So the validity, the design, in some sense, this, the randomization is not a problem, right? So we've got perfect balance and all the baseline stuff. The real problem is attrition, right? I mean, so doing stuff at the beginning is easy. Um, so what we do is we try to track every kid who applied for a scholarship. So in group two and group three, we're chasing everybody. But group one and group four, we got a representative sample, right? Because there's just too many of those kids to offer, okay? Um, 
So in group one, there's about 33% attrition and 39% in group four, but there's no differential attrition. So I'm not worried about this, right? Because kids just move all the time, right? This is over two, two and a half years. There's migrant Lego populations, the migrant communities. So these are the kids who start out with the private school or who don't apply, but there's no differential attrition, right? So that's not a problem. Where there is a slight problem is in my treatment group, there's about 10% attrition, and these are kids who just don't show up when they get the testing, right? I mean, and, but there's about 15% in the two control groups. And in fact, when we did the assessment at the end of two years, we had differential attrition of about 20%. And so that was such a disaster that we then went back for this massive three-month manhunt, right? Like, I mean, where, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this Chinese movie called Iga To Chao, like, you know, which basically means not one less, right? So there's it's the story about this village, uh, this village teacher who loses a kid in the school and how frantically the whole school goes ch chasing, searching for this one girl. So that's kind of what our field staff did, right? Like, you know, we went on this massive manhunt looking for every one of these kids, and we tracked down about 90% of them, okay? Uh, and sometimes they just move, right? I mean, they, they move outside the district, what are you gonna do, okay? So we do have, this difference is slightly significant, but there's no difference in observables, right? Like, you know, who we're losing. And if you run a model trying to predict attrition, that same model will predict attrition equally well in both the treatment and the control. So you can't predict that. So in some sense, if putting all the observables in, so that's a bit like Alfonso Tabor. Uh, you've got a, there's no selection observables whatsoever. So it does seem reasonable to think that there's no, there's no selection on observables. Uh, but then we do both inverse probability rereading and also the okay? So let me kind of just show you some results, right? I mean, and this is just showing you just what's going on with teachers. So by most observable measures, these government school teachers are quote unquote much better because they're more experienced and more likely to compete in a college of masters. They almost always have teacher training compared to less than about a quarter of these guys. Uh, but the private school teachers are more likely to come from the same village. But here's the big kicker, right? These government school teachers are paid about six and a half times more on average than these private school teachers. Uh, so one of the nice things about what we've done here, I think, is collected an enormous amount of process data, right? So this is not just a reduced form of saying, here's a treatment, here's a test score. We're, we're collecting detailed time use diaries from teachers, from kids, from parents, just to see everything about what might be changing here. Okay, so if you look at teacher time use data, what you see is on average, a private school teacher works about half an hour extra per day. This is about half an hour extra of class time and about 15 minutes more of correcting homework. So that's 45 minutes broadly of active and passive instruction. They do less administrative work, and the government school teachers spend about 15 minutes more per day administering the midday meal program. Right? So I mean, all of this is consistent with what one would expect in the way these schools are running, but it's about half an hour extra time per day. And then... What's the difference in midday meal school? Yeah, so I mean, I think this is... The time that teachers in private schools are maybe organizing recess or like stuff like that, but this is the actual video. Okay? But what about the number of days they're showing up? Right. Yeah, so that's the next one, right? So I'm going to show you that. Okay, so, uh, so then this is looking at activity at the classroom level, and this is looking at that teacher. <laughs> So many questions. Okay, good. Thank you for another one. Yeah, that's true. We're gonna have that. Okay. So, right. So this is you know on every measure of process. Okay, it looks like the private schools are doing better. So they're more likely to be engaged in active teaching. More likely to have a teacher in the class. Much more likely to appear in control of the class. So these are coded by our enumerators when they go like watch the classroom. And then this is then looking at it at the teacher level, right? So this is teacher absence. So when it's about eight percent in the private schools and about twenty-seven percent, right? That can mean in these government schools. Now notice that this looks much more stark than this, right? Is there a teacher present in the class? But that's because in the government school, if a teacher is absent, you just combine the grades, right? Like I mean, and then one teacher will be there in the class. So there will be few, there's a lot less difference in whether the teacher is present in the class, but a much bigger difference in teacher absence. So the denominator is classroom. It doesn't look so bad. If the denominator is teachers, then it's very bad. And you can see this here, right? Same teacher teaches another class in the same room, which is about 80% in these government schools and about 20%. Right? So this is kind of this composite story of what's going on in these schools. The teacher doesn't show up, you just come by them and sit down. Okay? This is, I'll, I'll skip through this quickly. Like, I mean, uh, this is just looking at student time use diaries. But there's one very important point here, right? So what this is, this panel is saying what is the typical difference between private and government schools. And this is the applicants versus the controls, okay? So in a way, what this is telling you is what is the typical difference and what this is telling you is how much of the difference is being bridged, right? Like, I mean, by these scholarship kids. But in a way, you want to look at this guy because this is the intention to treat, and this is blown up by a factor of about 1.4 to account for the actual fraction of kids who went to the private school. 
So what's very interesting here is you notice that in time spent in school, remember there's about a half an hour difference in the teacher time diary, so that's exactly consistent with what you see in the students. And over here, there's a complete catch up, right? I mean, so the scholarship kids are spending that extra half an hour a day in school. But what does not seem to have caught up is homework behavior, right? So over here, the typical private school kid does about 25 minutes extra a day of homework, but there's no extra time on homework for these scholarship kids. So what that's telling you is that behavior at home seems to be much, much harder to change, even for these scholarship kids, even though they're getting the scholarship, so they're spending more time in school, but they're not yet catching up in terms of homework time and homework behavior, uh, but they're spending more time playing with friends. So these kids spend about 20 minutes a day less playing with friends. There's no such difference here. So they seem to be, you know, so that's just where that missing time is going. Okay, now this is very interesting in terms of processes. Now, by now looking at what parents think, okay, parents, parents, mm, satisfaction in the school. And then, uh, so you notice that in general, parents are much more satisfied here, and we see that our scholarship parents are significantly more satisfied, okay? So the satisfaction difference almost looks like it's caught up with the typical satisfaction difference. But then, we're also asking the parents to rate their kids on two things. We're asking them to rate them on the levels of intelligence, discipline, interest, this hygiene, etc. And then we're asking the parents on the trajectories, okay? Like how do you feel the teacher is doing in improving each of these things, okay? Now what's interesting here that suggests that the parents are really quite on top of things, right? Like, I mean, that they're not clueless because they don't actually say that there's any, so if you look at this, there's a big difference in the levels, right? So the private school parents on average report higher intelligence, higher discipline, higher interest in school, homework, all of that stuff. But there's no difference in any of these things here except for hygiene. And I'll show you that this is backed up by the child data on using the toilet, okay? So what this is telling you is that the parents are not observing significant differences in levels on these outcomes two years into the program. But then if you ask them, how effective do you think your school is in improving these dimensions, right? Like, I mean, the parents are noticing a positive trajectory on each of these things, okay? So, and all of this is consistent with what we're seeing. So then if you look at interviewing the kids, so look at this, does the child use the school toilet? And so this is the one place where the catch-up seems to be almost complete, right? Like, I mean, so in the private school, you're much more likely to use the toilet, right? I mean, and you're being trained to do that. Um, but on a lot of other things, there's not that much change. Now, one thing here is that the scholarship kids are less likely to like going to school, okay? Because they're having to work harder, there's more homework. So the parents are happier, but the kids are not, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and there's a good reason for that. Uh, the other very interesting thing is for people who write the right to education, you know, Lang Pritchett has this famous description of India as a flailing state, right? That there's no connection between the head and the limbs, like you know, between what the policy says and what actually happens. So as per official education policy, corporal punishment is bad, right? I mean, there's not supposed to be any beating in school. But again, like this is very consistent in five years of work, about 80% of kids in government schools report having been beaten, like you know, I mean for something. And this is having been beaten in the past week, it's about 57%. Okay. So, so people are getting beaten in school, and this is just the way, this is just the way the school system is functioning. So now let's go look at what's going on with test scores, okay? And this is in some sense the major puzzle. So the major puzzle is that in every process outcome, it looks like the private schools are doing better, okay? But when you go look at the test scores, there's basically exactly zero effect, right? That can be overall um, of, of, of the program. Now, there's important heterogeneity by subject. So if you look at this, like you'll see that the English scores are significantly better, right? That can mean they're doing worse in math and the now notice, by the way, that this is not the correct control. So now I'm going to go to the correct control. And you see that this doesn't seem to make that much of a difference, but this is the right one. And the story is basically the same, right? That the English scores are positive on average by about 0.18 standard deviations. The Telugu is negative, and the math is negative and not significant. Now this is just taking a simple average of these three subjects. But you could imagine that if you were to do a market return weighted calculation, right, like, I mean, then the impact would be positive because there's other work suggesting that the market returns to English, like, I mean, are considerably higher, like, I mean, than the market returns to the native language. I'm sorry, the, the private schools are taught in English and the public schools are not. Right, no, so. Just but, picking up going to an English school? Exactly, right? So I'm going to break it down. Yeah. Non interesting. Right. <laughs> so, oh, it's. it's it's completely not interesting in terms of saying something more about the mechanics, but in terms of the policy question about private versus public schools, this is reflecting the distribution of English and Telugu medium schools that we see out there. And so this is again that reduced ball. Okay, so I'm gonna break this down by language. I'm, I'm gonna take questions in the break. Right? No, I mean, yeah. We're okay? Yeah. 
sexual differences or because of household characteristics might have something that you know need to back them up because when you take kids with exactly the same household characteristics you're not getting the change in high school. But one important question is what level of learning are the private schools optimized for? So if you look at all the work we're seeing on tracking and other things right now, plus my other work in learning trajectories, basically if what's going on in the private school is that the instruction is targeted to the median kid in the private school who's 0.6 standard deviations above the scholarship kid, it might well be that the instruction in the classroom is not targeted to where these kids are, which might be kind of why you get better results in say charter schools where all the kids that can even come from this background as opposed to moving some kids from a weak background into a <coughs> So that's one thing. There are adjustment issues, but then the most important thing to remember is that the value of the scholarship is only 40% of the poor child spending, right? That can mean in the government school. So you could completely spin this around and say, hey, you could go to private management and get the same effective results at 60% less spending. And then the relevant comparison becomes equalizing the spending and then thinking about different forms of management. So I think you know, I'll be a good researcher and say that there's something in here to keep every side happy or unhappy and that we need more research. So I'll, I'll just stop there and sorry for going. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this, this presentation is law. It's not, I'm neither reporting research nor this is a scientist he funded. So, uh, uh, but bear with me. I think it's still something interesting. Uh, so, you know, let's first start with this project. What is this program? This is the National Rural Livelihood Station. It is a poverty reduction project, that's how it's defined. But what it's basically doing is that it's forming self-help groups of women and integrating every government program that's funded self-help groups around the country into one, under one umbrella. Uh, and what it does is that it gets 10 to 15 women together in groups, uh, then federates the chair women of these groups into a village organization that then forms logistic organizations, kind of a federated structure where they sort of control each other uh, in a hierarchical setup. Once those self-help groups have been has been what is quote unquote saturated, that means you've done as many self-help groups as you can in every village, 
they start rolling out these sub-interventions, bank linkages, nutrition and health, disability, food security, education scholarships, handicrafts, all kinds of stuff. The idea is that you sort of form a base where you have these women's groups all integrated within each village, and then that forms a, 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 a forum by which you can start rolling out all kinds of uh, sub-interventions. Uh, the project is executed by the National Rural Livelihoods Mission, which is based in the Samrat Hotel on the sixth floor, if you're interested. <laughs> a society under the Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. Uh, One billion is from the World Bank, four billion from the Government of India. It's a five billion dollar project. Twelve states are the focus of this project. It's supposed to target 270 million women. So it's a hugely humongous project. Okay. Now, what are the key challenges of running a project of this kind? Now, uh, Ghazala Munspi and I have finished this very long book that Dilip Mukherjee had the unfortunately tedious task of reading every word of uh, recently uh, uh, because it's very long. But what we've done is that we've tried to sort of read the entire literature on participatory development, community development, and on decentralization, put it into the theoretical framework, and then sort of summarize the evidence from it and look at what, what, what that evidence tells us. And what it tells us is that, that these projects are, these sorts of interventions are enormously complex. They're complex interventions, uh, enormous amount of local heterogeneity, or enormous amount of heterogeneity in interventions. Uh, in order for them to succeed, what you need more than anything else is a strong culture of learning by doing. You can never get this right the first time. Designs can never be right the first time, so maybe in some cases. They constantly need to innovate. They constantly need to update as they go along. Otherwise, they don't work very well. So you need tracking, experimentation, evaluation, you need to understand process, have feedback loops, all this kind of stuff that you know no project ever does, right? So what we thought we would do, since we've given $1 billion to this project, is try to institute what we're calling a social observatory within this intervention, within this $5 billion intervention, that will basically, whose job it is, is to do this. And is to speak within the project as, a, as you know, do learning by doing. So that's what I want to describe. It's a design. This is so. What I'm going to present here is our is our vision, if you wish. Uh, the reality is going to be, I hope, close to the vision, but you know, one doesn't know. But uh, we're starting out on this right now. And the reason I'm doing this is for two reasons. I thought I would present it here. One is to basically tell you this is a laboratory that's coming up. Uh, there are going to be 12 states, minimum 25 states, you know, for the entire mission. Enormous amount of good research that can be done there. There's already a lot of research going on, as I'll talk about, and students can not only find jobs as interns and so on in all of these projects, uh, there are also potential dissertations to be had. So an IDC can you know, fund you to do these, this research. So uh, it's an invitation. All right. So what is the social observatory? Uh, I should say it's close to the collaboration of the project implementators. Mr. Vijay Kumar is the joint secretary in charge of the NRLM, and Parmesh Shah, who's the World Bank uh, leader of the project. OK. whole bunch of researchers are already working on this. You can see their names there. Um, and, and, and we're doing different things, and I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Uh, so, the first thing that we're doing with this, and this is as much a function of, 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 of the interest of the project as much as ours, in the words of the project director, he wanted a panel survey that was comparable to the NSS. So that's what he wants, right? So we're trying to turn that idea into something that is, allows us to evaluate the project at the state level. Now remember, each project is going to be different at the state level. India is a federated system. Each project is going to adjust the basic elements of this project with state structure. For instance, Tamil Nadu is doing much more linkages with panchayats. Uh, if you take Bihar, it's a much more sort of self-help group uh, parallel to panchayats kind of system. Uh, and there are all kinds of stuff going on. Now, this national uh, evaluation is, is going to sort of look at a whole bunch of outcomes. And you can see here basic economic outcomes, uh, whether debt reduction, asset portfolios, consumption, income generating activities, but we're also going to be looking at non-income dimensions of well-being, dignity, voice, mobility, say in household decision making, subjective well-being, and issues of public engagement, participation, political processes, and, and collective action. Uh, the sample size is going to be representative at the state level, the three round panels over five years, and all this data is going to be publicly available on, on the internet. Uh, that's a policy we're starting out with, so, any, so the idea is that anybody can look at this at any time. Uh, the, uh, so, you know, we're going to have household questionnaires and community questionnaires. Uh, now, the problem with this is how do you identify uh, the, the, the impact of, of the project at the national level? So you can't do it at the national level. You're going to have a state-specific design for this. Now, some states are very clear about using a poverty cutoffs, which blocks are allowed, you know, access to the project, which, which blocks are not. When those poverty cutoffs are transparent and clear, we can use a discontinuity design. But as I discovered in many states, the chief minister's district, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, block is always uh, below the poverty cutoffs. It's kind of interesting. 
Uh, so, you know, some sort of, if that's the case, we have to find another way and probably some sort of matching method. Uh, but, but that's going to be the challenge. It's not going to be some... Now, in some states, and those states are Bihar, Orissa, and Tamil Nadu, we've already negotiated a randomized rollout. So we're going to have a randomized design in at least three states, but as we start going around trying to sell this in other states, we might get more states to agree to a randomized rollout. Uh, the Bihar uh, 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 randomized rollout, the Bihar sort of uh, evaluation is basically a random assignment of the core SHD, the center of good prevention in 90 panchayat streets and 90 control. This time is done. Uh, the follow-up is scheduled for July, September 2013. I was, I guess I'm showing my age. Um, and and, and Oris has a similar uh, rollout of Bihar. Now, AP, Andhra Pradesh, which is the pioneer of the self help group movement, uh, I mean, you can't find any districts or blocks without self help groups. They're all, you know, as Karthik, I'm sure, will tell you, they're everywhere. So basically, what we're doing there is we're testing this health and nutrition rollout that they're doing uh, on top of the self help groups, which is basically child nutrition, child health, and go into all this if you're interested, and, and a sustainable ag uh, agriculture uh, intervention. Now, we opened the proposals for sub-interventions, evaluating sub-interventions in other states, and, you know, and, and that kind of thing. The, the key principle with this has always been that the research has to follow the intervention, not the other way around. Right? So, so really, the, the idea is to build a culture of learning by doing within the project themselves. So we negotiate these things with the government uh, so that they find the evaluation to be of interest and importance to them. Uh, and that is on which it's not. So the second element of this, so there are different elements of this. The second element is the monitoring element, which I think is just as crucial. What we're going to be doing is that we're going to be tracking every woman who joins a self-help group with a profile. And that profile is a two-page questionnaire that sort of lists out her land, her, her debt, her, her, her family sort of structure, and, and whether the kids are enrolled in school and so on. A very basic sort of uh, living standards information. This is going to be repeated every year. So we're going to have a database of, at the end, I hope 270 million women with basic information every year tracking their progress or their decline, as it were, on very basic indicators. The second thing is that every month, and in some states every week, the loan sheet that she fills out, what's called the DD sheet in Bihar and other places, she fills out a sheet, that every group fills out a sheet saying who's taken what loan, how much they've repaid of that loan. Every piece of that is going to be entered into a database. And then every sub-intervention, and all these women are going to have specific individual IDs and a set of group IDs, which is then going to be merged in with any other sub-intervention that takes place. So we'll have this humongous database of all states, panel, on very basic information, that is project data, which is the ma management information system of the project. That I hope, I'm trying to push, is made publicly available to researchers. Okay? Because I believe that's where scrutiny is going to come from. Now, to me, that's an enormously interesting source of information, in addition to the national survey we'll be doing, which will be, will be a much more detailed set of questions. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this data is that that data is then going to be aligned with dashboards. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, you know it's a good idea, and uh, certainly we like that. But when you put 270 million records on the website, out of 500 or uh, say um, 600 million women in India, uh, I think identification of the individual will be very easy. So, what about privacy and all those? So, so th these are these are important concerns. So. Yeah, so these, these are important concerns, and, and we have to sort of take out that privacy to make sure that, they, that, that we maybe attain that confidentiality. We have people working on these things. This is, this is still a working program. It's a huge thing with the census data, where they oh, can't have the census. You can, there's an app, so you can, you can, I mean, even with the suitable anonymization and so on and so forth, if you can so bypass look, that, that's Look, so these points are well taken. I'm, I'm at the moment giving you, I'm giving you an optimal design, I may not reach there. Right? Like, <laughs> so I'm giving you a thought, I'm giving you a very thinking. Yeah? <laughs> So, 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 so the government is saying it's very dangerous, we might not do that. But the point is that the project can have access to this information as well at every level, at the village level, the block level, the district level. And they'll have these dashboards that they'll be designing, which sort of be taking the iPhone concept, where the actual sort of design that the chap looks at is very simple. There's an enormous sort of statistical stuff going on behind us that they can look at tracking at different patterns. What are you going to do with people moving around? So I mean that's that's it's project data. So this is this is this, I mean, then we say that they moved around. That the self group is closed. Woman has moved out. The self group. We're not looking at non-members. Remember, just members of self group. <coughs> and we're going to tell you when they leave or when the group closes down. You don't try to track. Them. No, not not in this data. Okay. But making make the survey, we might try that, but not yet. This is this is project data. This is not our data. Really. Uh, so anyway, the internet posting we we we'll have to work on. Now uh, the second thing we're doing is process monitoring. Where, in addition to this quantitative data that's being collected, there'll be a random sample in each state 
where folks, where a team is going in and, and basically doing qualitative work, looking at project implementation problems, and looking at how the project has been working and how it's been interpreted and, 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 and dealt with by people, by, by, me, by mem members of the community, which will again be very useful to the project to understand what's working and what's not and how to fix it. Uh, and we're taking that just as seriously as we're tracking uh, the quantity of information, we're also tracking social and political changes this way. And again, you know, when you when you summarize these things, you want the project people to sort of get a get a two-page summary of these results and not a you know get one thousand page report because they actually you want them to use the data in, in, in management uh, decisions. Now in addition to this, we're going to be doing a series of research sort of more research qualitative studies in the state of Bihar. We are tracking match pairs of treatment control panchayats over a two-year period, we are going to these villages every three, every village every three months, getting detailed information, process of social and economic change. In AP, we've got the thought of looking at uh, the central group deliberative processes from the village blocking district level. We've been recording these meetings at every level and, and, and analyzing them. But again, the field is open. So, so if you know any sociologists interested in doing some qualitative work, you know, we have it properly. Uh, for the Bihar qualitative study, uh, what we basically did, the design is a mixed methods design. We are, we are doing, as I said, a randomized rollout with quantitative analysis uh, with 90 villages and uh, 90 panchayats on either side. Uh, a total sample of about seven or 8,000 households. Um, and, and, and we're looking at 10 panchats, five panchats sequence, five panchats control, where we're doing the qualitative uh, sort of uh, analysis, uh, yeah, which is a subset of the quantitative. So we're able to sort of get both sorts of uh, information from the same set of villages. Uh, some of the questions we're looking at qualitative stuff in Bihar. Uh, pretty obvious questions, but they sort of start getting more complex as we look more at them. Uh, let me skip that part. This, the, third, the third part of, sort of studies we're doing in Bihar, because this is just an example, Bihar is sort of more developed than the others, you can spend more time looking at it, and a set of field experiments. There's lots of stuff that you cannot get from uh, quantitative surveys and, uh, and from qualitative work that come by behavioral stuff, and this is joint work with Carl Hoff and a whole bunch of people, uh, where we're sort of looking at uh, the change in the development process that occurs within people, how their worldviews and self-concepts are changing, their sense of having basic rights, uh, and we're going to you know, undertake experiments to assess women's self-confidence, the ability to work with persons of higher social status in travels and bargaining, access to social networks, and the lenses with which they view the world. So a whole bunch of different stuff that, has, that comes from behavioral uh, studies. Uh, again, in Bihar, one of the interesting things we're trying to do, which we hope we can pull off, is we want to do the behavioral stuff in the same villages that we do the qualitative analysis. So we can understand the mechanism that result in the outcomes we get from behavioral analysis. Right? So we'll really be able to when you see the results of, the, of some experiment, you'll be able to tell what about what is it about these villages that resulted in these outcomes. And remember, you have treatment control, so that's that's a big difference and over time. Uh, some some details of the experiments are given there. Let me, let me just skip that part. Now, what is really important, I think, particularly for the ISI and organizations like this, is that this particular unit, this social observatory, what we're calling a social observatory, is the academic interface of the project. It is where academics will come, Indian, international, whoever. And, and, and these and they play the role of matchmaker. Okay, you're interested in these guys. Karthik just came to us and said, you know, want, wanted to uh, study uh, uh, cash versus kind uh, uh, food security program. So we're trying to match him up with the Biharis who want to do this, who are interested in doing this kind of thing. That's that's kind of our job, is to match make researchers with project interest in, in, in the different states. So this will be the academic interface. It's guided by an advisory committee that we're trying to still uh, get put together. Uh, there, there's a fund available. There's going to be a fund for researchers, and this is particularly for Indian researchers. Yeah, I mean, uh, not IDC level funding, but but, but certainly appropriate for. And, and you, you know, you want to you want to take a year sabbatical and study this, uh, but, you know, from the ISI or from or from some other Indian institute, uh, they'll be able to fund that. You want you want to collect some data, uh, and that's so long as you know there'll be a research company looking at this and decide whether that makes sense or not. The idea is to really start doing this in a way so that it becomes sort of normal. Uh, for researchers to be involved in projects. We believe that bring an enormous amount of external scrutiny to the project itself. It's not going to be something that goes on, like so many other projects in India, uh, you know, in isolation from scrutiny. And this is not just academic scrutiny. We believe academic scrutiny will bring in civil society scrutiny as well. So the idea is to sort of build on the progressive model and say the KDP model in Indonesia to change the nature by which projects are done. Uh, right. So. So, what, so just, just to sort of, just to sort of uh, conclude, I mean, this is really a flagship project. It's after the, I think the NIDGA is the, it's the second biggest uh, uh, rural poverty project in India. 
the idea is to change it into a data-driven project, to change the culture of learning by doing different <laughs> within Indian projects generally, uh, but do that sort of that, that do it in a way that's not so about doing an impact evaluation, the randomized trial, but bring within an enormous amount of process information, enormous amount of monitoring information, and an enormous amount of information about qualitative change. Uh, with experimentation, with constant experimentation learning from failure. As I said, we're open to ideas and potential collab collaborations. And I don't know, collaboration doesn't mean I want my name on everything. The collaboration means that people be matching you to appropriate research projects. Uh, we're looking for young people. And, and I don't know how many folks qualify here as young people, but looks I see so many who might qualify, who are actually looking for uh, in, you know, one year internship, two year internships. No, young meaning you don't have a PhD yet, that's what I mean. So, 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 so if you're looking for a, for, a, for, a, for, a, for, for a year off and you want a job, okay, I got jobs for you. Right? <laughs> That's the point I want to make. Uh, and, and, and at different levels. Uh, you can work and you can be embedded within a state. The states need a good economist to work there. You can be you can be in the national level program. So let me just stop there and you know. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. How is the sample framework level? Because we believe there's a state level evaluation. Uh, now, at the same time, there has to be enough uh, variation across treatment and control. So we can either use a matching method or some sort of discontinued design to get to get you know have enough power to get some results. So all these criteria will have to come into this determining the sample size. There's budget, so that's not the issue. The problem is going to be implementation, finding a survey firm that can actually pull this off, and that's a big concern that we have. Yeah. What decide whether they join That's right. That's important. That's important. But then. What, sorry, what's the parent point you're presenting? What they actually get okay. when they join? Right, so it's, it's a so basic microcredit, right? So it's a basic microcredit project. Yeah. You get a pot of money that, you know, yeah. women in the group yeah. decide who gets what for what purpose. They recreate to the group. The group then replays it to the village organization. So, so that's what, and that goes okay. on. So that's right? like a group meeting. That's the big, that's the core intervention. But on top of that, they're getting an enormous amount of inputs and empowerment, right? So, of various kinds and, 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 of, and of sort of uh, doing public uh, collective action type things. How do you fix the PDS? How do you fix the, the panchayat and so on? They're doing some of that. But then once that's set up as a base, they're rolling out these sub-interventions. So nutrition interventions, which is basically uh, finding women and kids and, and visiting them every month uh, to make sure that, they, that they're getting adequate nutrition. So that's one of the interventions, the food security intervention. The women decide who in the group is poor enough to, to sort of be eligible for food security. Then they get sort of some rice and dal. It sounds an awful lot like BRAC. But I, 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 so, so, so who is this organization shelling out the credit and doing all this? The stuff? National Rural Livelihoods yeah. Mission. So it's a state. It's, it's, a, it's a government of India approved project that is then working with state governments to implement it. So that's, that's what's common across. That's what's common across the entire country. Yeah. yeah. So what is the provision of traffic, uh, women who migrate after, especially after marriage, and most of them women? Villages, they are to migrate to other villages or bigger towns or cities. How do you track? Right. So, so, so there are two levels of tracking we have to worry about. In, in the monitoring data, we don't track them at all, right? Because that's that's part of project data. We're just interested in who is actually in a group in a particular village. If they leave, they just count it as leaving, and so that's that's identified, right? Now, that is a problem in our in our survey, which is which is the evaluation that we're doing. In Bihar, what we're trying to do is we we we, we, we try very hard to sort of find where these women go and what we and what happens to them or at least get information from others in the village of where they are. Uh, we've not done the second round survey yet, so we don't know how much of a problem we have as a tradition of that kind, uh, but, but that's, what, that's what we hope to worry about. Um, and we hope to follow similar strategies in every state. It's going to be a challenge. Yeah? Do you think the last thing that you do is just the zero one number? Well, uh, in, 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 in Bihar and in Orissa we and Rajasthan now, we're collecting detailed caste information. There is also an intervention we had called the Mahadalit intervention, which is for sort of uh, the poorer Dalits. And there, we are trying very hard to collect detailed caste information to look at sort of allocation within the Dalit groups. Right. So we're trying to do that as well. Yes, sir. Would you, um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on setting this up in the first case. Uh, we need your help, Santosh. You know? I, I, I should tell you that I was actually directly involved in bringing about an RLM and taking the under on the program to scale the whole country, so I'm absolutely delighted that you're putting this, this in place. One of the issues that arose from the research that was done in Armstrong loans towards product, you know, productive loans, you know that the 
one of the outcomes of the rapid expansion of the microfinance system in Andhra was that the, the government of Andhra actually cracked down on the microfinance institutions in Andhra. And the big difference, I guess, between Velugu on the one hand, of which an RNM is the national version, and uh, the microfinance institutions is that they tended to enable uh, you know, the poor to come out of sort of consumption loans towards it. So I hope that's one key analytical question or research question that you will focus on in your research program. Yeah, so both in the data set, uh, that the, the MIS data set, there's detailed loan information. That's already there actually in AP and in Bihar. So somebody wants to look at it, you can look at it right now and look at how that changes. In AP, you can track how that changes with time. Right. Certainly in Bihar, we're going to be trying to be very careful to see that we can do that as well. We could be doing that hopefully in the whole country. So in the management system, there is that database. Now in the survey that we're doing, the work that we're doing in Bihar, uh, we're trying very hard to get village level information, different sources of credit, uh, including money lender credit, but also sort of commercial credit, microfinance credit, and all this kind of stuff, and see, look at competing sources, Let's look at the credit markets in some detail. So we're looking at that in some detail. But, you know, it is an open question. I mean, this AP issue is an open question. And my hope is that we did get a proposal from an organization that will not name that had a very unsatisfactory proposal. Look at this. But if somebody, this is a fascinating question that some serious economist wants to look at it. And, and we are happy to facilitate uh, matching the project with that researcher. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Vijay and Karthik, and for the you five minutes for a question, but 